In the deserts of Turkmenistan, the fundamental rhythm of life has remained unchanged for centuries. The end of civilization as we know it would be of only passing interest here. Sandwiched between competing empires for much of its history, Turkmenistan is a forgotten place. Out here, the camel is still king. Of course, a few people have cars. They watch television and listen to the radio. But none of those modern conveniences can match the singular importance of the camel. Turkmenistan is one of the poorest countries to emerge from the ruins of the old Soviet Union, yet potentially it's one of the richest. It has some of the largest reserves of natural gas found anywhere in the world, and there's plenty of oil too. The problem at the moment is that the pipelines carrying that oil and gas go up through Russia and onto places like Ukraine that can't or won't pay world prices for the products. So the Turkmenistan government wants to head a new pipeline off into Iran, then on to Turkey and sell its oil and gas directly to states in Western Europe. If it does that, it could turn Turkmenistan into another Kuwait. In the year 2000, you will come here and you will see the absolutely different society. We don't need, we don't want to take uh, many years. On the outskirts of the capital Ashgabat is a symbol of the hope and expectation that has filled this place since independence. Standing out like a mini Las Vegas in waiting is a strip of state-owned hotels, including a casino. They've cost millions of dollars, and most of the time, they're empty. They represent both the potential wealth of Turkmenistan and the current government's failure to convert that potential. Part of the problem has been that when Turkmenistan first got its independence, one, the people in the government felt that, gee, we're a wealthy country because we have these resources. In other words, they were taking the, they were translating the potential of the country into something that was actual, and that uh, just was not, uh, not there. Each Sunday, most of Turkmenistan's four million plus population seems to be at the market in Ashgabat. It's everything from carpets to camels here, an energetic reminder that Turkmenistan's tribal past is not far below the surface. In the National Theatre, they were having a folk music competition. Not a big crowd, it has to be said, but then it was the middle of the day, and most people have to earn a living first. The competitors, at least, seemed enthusiastic. The resurgence of Turkmen culture is, quite naturally, an important symbol of independence. But the other symbol of the new Turkmenistan is altogether harder to justify and inherently less stable. Throughout the streets of the capital are pictures of the man who's promised to lead Turkmenistan into prosperity. Sapa Murat Niyazov used to be head of the Communist Party here. Now he's president of independent Turkmenistan, and he's assumed the grander title of Turkmenbashi, chief of the Turkmen. He's also the creator of a personality cult that has no real parallel in the ex-Soviet Union. His portrait hangs on most public buildings, and Turkmenistan television is simply a catalogue of his daily triumphs amid an adoring public. Bayramalik 
Niyazov was elected in 1992, claiming a mere 99.5% of the vote. Last year, he held a referendum in which just 99.9% .9 of his constituents purportedly voted yes to keeping him president until 2002. In the parliamentary election six months ago, 50 candidates ran for the 50 seats, one in each district. Any pretense at democracy has been sacrificed in the name of stability. We can uh, just proclaim that multi-party system is, is there and tomorrow uh, three, four, five, ten parties would be created by maybe 70, 20, 25 people. They will claim that they are parties. But that will create a lot of social uh, disturbances. And uh, uh, this is one of the games we don't want to play with our uh, independence. In southern Turkmenistan, the desert finally gives way to rough pasture. This is the home of the famed Akhilteki horses. A century and a half ago, they would have been used in battle against the Russians. Ah. Turkmen, знаешь, что такое слово есть Turkmenia? Утром стан отцом поздоровается, отцом. Второй раз лошадом поздоровается. Nowadays they're bred for racing, and no prizes for guessing who's the chief patron, fancier, and owner of Akhilteki horses in Turkmenistan today. President Niyazov, of course. Imam Guli is the trainer of the president's horses. These horses also seem to form an important part of Turkmenistan foreign policy. Britain's John Major has been given one. Francois Mitterrand is also a recipient. Iran's President Rafsanjani wanted to climb aboard for a test ride. We gave a hotel to sit down. It's not safe if it goes, it's not safe. Then we didn't allow them to sit down. The reasons for this equine largesse are simple enough. Beyond these mountains lies Iran, the route Turkmenistan favours for its pipeline to Turkey. But political considerations put Iran off limits for American investors, and although the Turkmenistan government says it'll go ahead and start the project, it'll need help, probably from other European countries, if it's to realise its full potential. We understand that pipeline infrastructure is the pillar of our independent development and the pillar for survival of this government. We are, we are very realistic uh, people in, in this government and whatever we can do for our nation, we shall do. For the moment, most people in this country are probably willing to continue with President Niyazov's plan of 10 years of stability in exchange for prosperity. While wages here are low, food prices are heavily subsidised, electricity, water and salt are free, and there's a promise to extend that to bread soon as well. In any event, dissenting voices are simply not tolerated. Avdi Kuliev was a middle-ranking career diplomat in the Soviet Foreign Ministry when he decided to return to Turkmenistan in 1990 and become its foreign minister. But he soon fell out with Niyazov and is now heading an unofficial opposition from Moscow. He accuses President Niyazov of jailing and even torturing political opponents. В отношении меня он сам мне угрожал, что если я не перестану быть демократом, если я буду заниматься политикой и оппонировать его, он мне говорил открыто, это его слова. Independent reports have also criticized Niyazov's methods. There are violations, not of broad human rights the way, let's say, occurred during the Stalinist uh, period, or even later periods in the Soviet Union, but certainly violations of political rights.
President Niyazov has succeeded in putting himself at the centre of a national cultural, social and hopefully economic revival. A generation is growing up being told that to criticise their political leader is to betray their heritage and their nation. But will the people of Turkmenistan still be obedient if the prosperous future they've been promised remains just a dream? Thank you.